So my name is John O'Malley. I'm a Jesuit. I've been uh, uh, teaching at uh, different places, but the last uh, 13 years I've been at Georgetown University. I'm in the theology department, but I'm a historian by trade. And uh, my, uh, I suppose my specific fields are the Italian Renaissance, and then the history of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, and then the history of the last three councils, the Council of Trent, Vatican I, and Vatican II. Mm -hmm. And where did you do your studies? Well, I did, I mean, I did my, most of my undergraduate at Loyola University of Chicago, and I did a Master's of Arts degree at Loyola Chicago, and I did my uh, doctorate at Harvard. But while I was at Harvard, I was awarded a fellowship and spent two years in Rome at the American Academy in Rome, a secular institution, but I was there from 1963 to 1965. So I was there when the Second Vatican Council was in session, and that what sparked my fascination with the council. I've asked John to talk a little bit about the development of Catholic social teaching and social commitment, commitment to peace and justice, perhaps, um, well, during the past century, let's say, you know, and how Vatican II kind of uh, confirmed the commitment that a lot of Christians, a lot of Catholics were already uh, acting on, and then how Pope Francis has really moved us forward, especially in regard to concern about the environment. I think the first thing that we need to realize is uh, the uh, the trauma really of the 19th century for the church that all at once uh, liberty equality and fraternity kind of upset everything and a new uh, the industrial revolution brought people into the city a new proletariat uh, the rise of communism and so forth so this was a, a brand new situation for the church and they didn't know what person how to deal with it so the breakthrough came in uh, 1891 with Pope Leo XIII's encyclical Rerum Novarum about new things, namely about this new situation. Which uh, really dealt with the problem of labor and the exploitation of labor and uh, he made clear that uh, Private property was a right, but it was not absolute, that uh, uh, the capital had an obligation to uh, the workers. And also, the, the really the revolutionary thing about, about it was that he said that workers had a right to unite. And uh, this, the Catholics didn't like this. Uh, first of all, what business does the church have to be dealing with economic and social questions? The church is about getting to heaven, you know, the Ten Commandments. So uh, it took a lot of flack for it, but it was a real breakthrough. Uh, and because uh, if you let workers organize, what does this mean? It's, uh, you know, uh, they're a force now in society. So it was really an important, very important uh, moment. The, the bigger picture here is that all at once the church had its foot now into what they used to call the temporal order. That's what's really going on outside in society. 
that the church has a voice there so the encyclical had a good impact in many parts of Europe and certainly in the United States but the um, uh, was really on the sidelines so the uh, rerum novarum was now taught in seminaries but taught in a philosophy course uh, one credit course so it's a kind of a, a side issue really in seminaries and therefore in general with Catholics then in uh, 40 years later Pope Pius XI issued his encyclical uh, quadragesimo anno 40 years 40 years after Rerum Novarum which sort of furthered this whole movement uh, then so in the meantime uh, there were a lot of Catholic organizations uh, workers Catholic worker movement and so forth uh, so this was now becoming really a very important part of the Catholic scene so Pius XI uh, moved the whole issue forward another step so the church was really now casting its glance uh, to the world as it really was the great uh, moment however was the Second Vatican Council uh, so it begins with, uh, uh, with the council just a few days after it opened something was not planned at all the bishops spontaneously got together and issued a message to the world uh, nobody pays too much attention to that message but it's extremely important because what it did it, it said was uh, we're gathered here and we're gathered here because of you people out there and we want this uh, meeting to be something that uh, uh, deals with your needs especially the needs of the poor and the neglected and those who uh, are most in need of our help so it was a kind of set the tone for the council then as the council worked on moved on it developed the famous document on Gaudium et Spes on the church in the modern world. Council about the world, the world in which we live. Uh, and so the first part is a beautiful document about the dignity of the human person, the dignity of marriage, and the dignity of labor, the dignity of work. Then the second part deals with uh, specific issues, war and peace, nuclear uh, stockpiling, uh, family, marriage, um, all kinds of really, uh, uh, the arts, uh, all, almost every aspect of the world in which we live. Uh, so it's an extremely important document.
So it's interesting about the council. It does not have a specific document on social teaching. Yet, the whole council, you might say, was uh, oriented towards that. Uh, every document, in a sense, is about the church in the modern world. Every document is, was written and put together because where are we today and how does the church deal with it? So what happened then after the council was Catholic moral theology, which was before the council, it was basically a discipline for the clergy. Uh, this is how the clergy in training learned how to hear confessions and help people in the confessional. It was very one-on-one -on -one and really did not have much to do with social issues. Uh, with the council, that no longer worked. Uh, now Catholic moral theology had to uh, uh, be expanded to deal with social issues. So Catholic moral teaching now is strongly social. This is a real change. So it's, it's now pervades the whole enterprise of Catholic ethics, Catholic moral theology, and so forth. Of course, the Ten Commandments, one's personal morality is crucial, basic, but it's not enough. Uh, one has to look beyond that to the world in which we live and how one's life contributes to the well-being of the world as such this world here and now. So that's, for me, one of the big uh, impact that the, impacts that the council made. Uh, and what it did was give each of us, and most especially priests, bishops, and the popes, this mission of uh, helping the world as such. Uh, we have a responsibility to each other in a social way to work together for the betterment of this world. So poverty, peace, and then with Pope Francis, Laudato Si, with the environment. So it's all part of a big continuum that we're now in, I might say, the golden age of this development, which begins with Pope Leo the Thirteenth, and then with Pope John the Twenty Third. I forgot to mention. Uh, so John the Twenty Third, just before he died, after the first period of the Council. So the Council met from 1962 to 1965. Pope John died in June of 1963, just before he died. He himself issued a uh, social encyclical, Pacem in Terrace, Peace on Earth. Peace on Earth. So here, and there was, what was unusual about it, the first time in history, a papal encyclical was addressed to all people of goodwill. So now, this, these social issues, the church is now speaking not just to Catholics, but to the world. So it's got a, a voice 
a moral voice for the world. Now, in a sense, of course, it always had that. But now it has this in a very articulated and specific and uh, focused way. So in the world today, uh, look at Pope Francis. I mean, he is the, you might say, the moral voice, the moral compass, not just of Catholics. I don't know what your experience is, but my experience is so many non-Catholics tell me how much they like the Pope and how much they listen to his message. John, I was wondering if you might say something about the background or the elements of scripture, sacred scripture, that um, have been kind of the foundation for the church's social doctrine, social teaching. Well, in one sense, it pervades the whole scripture. I mean, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, because uh, love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So it's there in the Hebrew scripture and in the Christian scriptures. Uh, and evident, often it's but more or less traditionally been interpreted as kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I help you, you my neighbor, the you, this woman, this guy. Uh, what's happened is it's been expanded to uh, a larger campus of not just one-on-one, -on -one, the whole, the whole human situation is, uh, and grows out of that very basic idea. And then more specifically, I mean, the, for me, the uh, key is, uh, one of the keys is the 25th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, where uh, the Lord comes in glory and says, uh, you know, come ye blessed and uh, enjoy the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Uh, because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was in prison, you visited me, and so forth. So these are a, a kind of a basis for, uh, it, it, it's not, this is not optional. This is, if you don't do this, you don't get to heaven. It's pretty serious. Uh, uh, if you do it, you get to heaven. 
I, I just think, for instance, when when Pope Francis made one of, those, one of his visits and brought back to the Vatican uh, 12 Muslim refugees, So they thought, oh yeah, nice gesture, very pastoral gesture and so forth. And, you know, but now he does this because that's the kind of person he is and he wants to um, and also give an example, especially to, to nations, of their responsibility and so forth. That's all true. But it seems to me he's making a very important doctrinal statement. Uh, yes. I'm doing this because my salvation and your salvation depends on this. That's pretty basic. And there's the whole Old Testament. It's a, it's a people. It's a people moving. So it's social. There's a social texture there. Uh, the church now is using the expressions like um, sinful social structures and... What would those things mean to you? Could you explain those terms? Well, I think it's not terribly complicated that uh, sinful social structures, namely that uh, sometimes the structures of society need to change to uh, accommodate uh, basic Christian morality. You have this in embryo with Pope Leo the Thirteenth when he, for instance, allowed. Uh, and encourage workers to organize. So they created a structure, uh, and it's a structure to counter uh, an oppressive structure. So uh, there are no perfect structures in society. Let's take that for granted. But there's some that are uh, really oppressive and uh, unjust in their very way that they operate. And so that's that Catholics have an obligation to help change that to make the, the, the social situation uh, better, the institution of society better, not mm -hmm. just individuals and so forth. To change structures and policies which hurt people, basically, which right. uh, are hurt, destructive, yeah. destructive of people. Yeah. Those would be sinful social yeah. structures. What about in the society of Jesus? How has have these changes in the church affected us in the Jesuit order? Well, they've affected the, the Jesuits very much. It's interesting that, uh, it's a, of course, especially after the Second Vatican Council, but not, this was going on actually before the Council in the Society of Jesus. The, uh, there was, for instance, in the United States, the uh, this Institute of Social Order, which were very highly trained sociologists, uh, economists, and so forth, working together, publishing a journal about social justice and uh, all these contemporary issues. So the basis was there. Then the council comes along with uh, the its message, doubting what spares, the hopes, the joys, and so forth of the people of the world are our hopes and joys and griefs. So um, then with uh, the general Pedro Arupe founding the uh, Jesuit Refugee Service, this was another breakthrough uh, moment when uh, now the Jesuits were working for an institution for a very pressing social issue, never more pressing than it is today, of course. And then the General Congregation 32, which was 1974 and 1975, members at that congregation issued its famous Decree 4, saying that the uh, purpose of the Society of Jesus is the, uh, uh, promotion, of, uh, the promotion of justice as well as the, uh, the firming up of uh, faith of the faith of the people.
So it gave the society a brand new kind of commitment along that line. And the judges have been, I think, exemplary in carrying that out in the community in decades. I'd just like to hear you talk about the, the tension in the church at the Episcopal level, the apparent opposition to Francis. Is that a is that a throwback to the to the pre <coughs> Navarum or to the individual? We're not concerned about the world. We're concerned about our Catholics. I think with Pope Francis, uh, first the in the. Uh, it's especially true in North America. I don't, I don't think I don't know about uh, Latin America. Certainly not not as not as pronounced in Europe, but in North America, especially I mean the United States, basically, the uh, the moral and the social issue became abortion, and it's a terrible evil, um, and you know, the, the church is trying to do something as, as opposed to it. It's, there's a lot to be said about that issue, but um, and this was the focus. And then Pope Francis comes along, and of course, he, he too is, is certainly not in favor of abortion, but he has a bigger vision. And uh, I think that the especially the American bishops don't get it. Here's the thing about Pope Francis he's just a pastoral pope, you know, so he does these nice pastoral things. No. This pastoral stuff is doctrinal. When he brings back those Muslims, he's saying, here, I was a stranger, you took me in. If that isn't basic Catholic teaching, I don't know what is. So uh, the, uh, he's, he's trying to, uh, to expand the range, the practical range of especially bishops, especially American bishops, purview of what their responsibilities are. So here's Pope Francis. There's Pope John Paul II, uh, J2P2. How do they approach? Uh, they're both post-Vatican II. Uh, I there might be, are there some differences between the two and how they approached it, um, and what does that portend for the future? Two great popes, Pope John Paul II and Pope Francis. They're very different. Uh, here's one basic difference between them, which I think is very important. Uh, pope Francis is the first pope in the last 50 years not to have participated in the Second Vatican Council. Now, from my point of view, that's a big advantage because he's not still fighting some of the battles of the council that I think all the subsequent popes uh, Paul the sixth, John Paul II, and so forth, we're doing an unconscious level and so forth. Uh, I think Pope Francis has a, because he wasn't there, because he was in Argentina, had a good education, has a more serene and uh, comprehensive view of the council. It sounds sort of absurd, but I, I think that I think that's the case. He also, Pope Francis, is a Jesuit. And he was at General Congregation 32 that published that decree on faith and justice. Uh, he has that burned, we, those, it was a very difficult congregation. I was there, as I said, and he had that burned into our souls. So that's part of his very being. John Paul II had a whole different experience. He came out of a siege mentality, uh, so defense of the faith. He had a broad vision. I mean, so what was one of the big messages of Vatican II? If you wanted to say what was Vatican II about in one word, what would you say? I would say reconciliation. It's reconciliation. Dialogue, reconciliation with the modern world, reconciliation between the bishops and the Pope, reconciliation between Western culture and, and other cultures, so forth. So reconciliation. So John Paul II was exemplary in reaching out, reconciling with the Muslim, reconciling with the Jews, and so forth. John, uh, Pope Francis does the same. And of course, Pope John Paul II was very much concerned with the social order, with peace and justice, um, no doubt about it. 
But with Pope Francis, it's a, it's a, a larger look at that. It's, it's a, he's, he, because he wants to get kids step back, he has a whole different experience, the experience of the Latin American church, the experience of being a, uh, the Society of Jesus, the non-experience of Vatican II. So I think this culminates in his encyclical Laudato Si on the environment. This is a new step, but, and popes have never directly addressed the environment before, uh, but they've never addressed the labor problem before either. And now, I know there are people who don't believe this, but uh, global warming and, and warming and then the whole destruction of the environment, the human, the Earth's resources are not limitless. Uh, and if we care about future generations, we have to have some care for, as the title is, care for our common home. That's the subtitle of the, uh, the encyclical. So uh, it's a new venture into the human problem, the problem of the human situation, which I think is crucial. And again, the Pope, and that encyclical, it's not just he was sitting in, his, in the chapel thinking up these ideas. And he was very carefully prepared with experts from all over the world. It was not you know, just dashed off. So it's a highly sophisticated document. Many Jesuits, perhaps the majority, are involved in educational institutions. How would we translate this mission of the Society of Jesus into the educational apostolate? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, let me say that I think that is now being done insofar as our poor human efforts can do something like that. They're much more focused, uh, much more uh, aware of their social responsibility and doing their best to inculcate a sense of that responsibility in students. Now, formal schooling, in my opinion, is a very uh, impractical and uh, inefficient enterprise. It's, uh, you look back at your own education, you, what, what you remember, and who influenced you, and how were you influenced, and so forth, all depends on what you come with. But, uh, so we do our best, and I, so, I mean, I teach at Georgetown again now, I'm the president, I mean, men are women for others, and uh, the whole justice enterprise, and uh, religious uh, toleration, uh, religious uh, dialogue, Reconciliation, I should say, rather than tolerance. Uh, these are preached day after day after day. So, do students and do faculty hear it? Do they? Well, some do, sir. Uh, I think for St. Ignatius himself, we think of St. Ignatius the pilgrim. Everybody reads the autobiography. He was going all over the place and was a man on the move. For the last 15 years of his life, he sat in Rome as CEO of a big international organization. And I think in his maturity, he came to see the uh, enduring impact of institutions. The universities are extraordinarily, and high schools are extraordinarily important institutions. Uh, and ext extraordinarily important opportunities for the Jesuits to uh, get the message across, and not just to the students, but to parents. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very discouraging enterprise, but uh, I think it's important. Hmm. What was the impact of Vatican II? Well, the immediate impact was liturgy in the vernacular, liturgy in English. Or now you could pray with your Protestant relatives and friends. That's good, that's extremely important. But the big issues are the ones we've been talking about. And that was so exciting for me to see reconciliation among religious groups. This is, this is, this is remarkable. 
reaching out, trying to, reach, to reconcile with the Muslims, the eternal enemy, uh, with the Reformation, then this look out to the world uh, uh, and to improve the, to the church's commitment to this here and now, uh, this is, uh, for me, very exciting.